Hello, my name is Emmy DeGrappa. Each week, we bring you stories asking our guests the question why. We learn about passion, purpose, and the human experience. Brought to you by Wyoming Humanities, with the generous support of the Wyoming Community Foundation, this is What's Your Why? Today we're talking to Patricia McEnroy. She is a filmmaker, photographer, and professor, and she originally grew up in Casper, Wyoming. Welcome, Patricia. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, thanks for joining me. I thought it was interesting that you grew up in Casper, you since left the state, but filmmaking has been your passion or storytelling. I always think about filmmaking as storytelling. What do you think? Absolutely. I'm actually really glad you said that because storytelling encompasses a lot more. I enjoy writing. I enjoy communicating through photography. And so I think storytelling captures it really well. I do too. And as I watched some of your films on YouTube, I was thinking you're really telling a story. You're you're giving a perspective from someone else's point of view. And I wanted to know how did how did that become your journey? I'm not sure how far back you want to go, but I was I was thinking about that, knowing I was going to talk to you. And I, I really got started in 4-H in Wyoming. Photography was a project you could take in 4-H. And so when I was in grade school, I got a little Instamatic camera. And then I graduated to a DSLR, which is one with all the manual controls. And then I decided to, to take it at Casper College when I went there. And so everything just kind of grew out of that. And so when when you were in 4-H, I think that that is really fun and interesting, that photography was already a passion, and then you just kept growing in it and took it a step farther. But filmmaking and photography are also very different. So how did you work into filmmaking? <laughs> That's a really good point. Uh, I, you know, when I was younger, I was like, I don't want to shoot video. I just love the moment. You know, I love capturing that moment that's so separate from all the moments around it. But uh, the truth is, is that working for print media, I, you know, you could see that it wasn't going to be going on forever. Once everything started going online, you could sort of see like this isn't going to last forever. They started giving us video cameras when we were working for newspapers and just with no instructions, just like go out and shoot this, you know, and, and they wanted us to shoot with a still camera and a video camera at the same time. That's before they they had things that were integrated. So you know, I'd be trying to shoot a, a wildland fire with both a still camera and a video camera with, and I thought I got to figure out, I got to learn what I'm doing here. So I ended up going back to grad school. Where did you go to grad school? So I went to a school called uh, Vermont College of Fine Arts, and it's a low residency program, meaning you go back in person every six months. But in between that time, you find a person on site to be your your on site instructor and you do all the work. That way you can live wherever you already are. I loved that model because I actually became connected with people all over the United States um, instead of just all of us being in the same location. So. So really, you first started out your career as a photojournalist, right? That's correct. Yep. Which I think is very fascinating, and especially the way you started out, which I think is so interesting how technology has really just taken off. And and now with social media, people are making videos and they're being little professional photographers. I mean, really not (laughs) professional, but you know what I mean? They're they're taking amazing photos from their um, phone. But what do you think how that has changed your career or your profession? I mean, I think the key for me was I kind of had to go with the flow. You know, you could fight it and say, well, you know, I'm going to stay here until this newspaper folds, which is what happened to the last daily newspaper I worked for. Or I could try to figure out like what's next. And so I I agree. There's everyone kind of is their own media outlet (laughs) right now with social media. Everyone can put all of their information and images out there. But I do think there's a difference when you when you've taken the time to get Um, trained on it a little bit more or tried to take it to another level. And I think you can tell the difference. Right. So how did you uh, start making films? Because I 
I looked at your film. I'm so intrigued by it and wanted to know what was your inspiration for making the film called Invisible Wyoming? Let me try to address both of those. How I learned it. Well, when I went to grad school, I kind of didn't know what I was doing. When I signed up for grad school, I was like, this school sounds great. And it seems so philosophical. Well, once I got there, I realized I had actually signed up for a conceptual art program. I wasn't, I wasn't in a tradition. Like what I, I thought they were just going to help me get better and better at photography and maybe teach me some video. But you had to learn all the technical stuff on your own. And then they give you feedback on the content. Well, in reality, that's what we actually have to do in the world. Like, even if someone taught me the technical stuff today, it would change, you know, in six months. So it turns out that was a really good model. As far as the Invisible Wyoming story, that's just always been one of those stories that I had on my in, in, in my mind. Like, I want to tell this. This is a story that I want to tell. And I think I'm the person that can tell it. And, and it's about the LGBTQ community in Wyoming. And having lived through that experience... When I would tell people about it, they would find it interesting. And so that's that for me is kind of a when when I when I'm getting that kind of feedback from people, that helps me realize, oh, this is a story I could share. So interesting. One, I think Wyoming is invisible in in many other ways. I mean, uh-huh. yep. I, you've captured it in this one way with the LGBTQ community. But as I've been talking to people and learning how they come here and why they come here, and sometimes they come here for a job and they say, I never even knew Wyoming existed. That is, that is, that is really on target. Um, I think I found leaving the state, first of all, I, I don't think I realized I had really kind of grown up in a subculture of the United States because I didn't even just grow up in Casper. I was 10 miles outside of Casper. And so when you come from that perspective and then you're going to other places in the United States or outside of the United States, you realize, oh, I had a pretty unique experience that I really treasure. Um, I also think when I would say I'm from Wyoming, especially to someone from outside of the country, they literally had never heard of the state. So I learned to either carry a little map with me or just start explaining what all states were around it (laughs) so that people would have a point of reference. Well, I think that's funny because I was just recently in Brazil uh, with my daughters and my daughter Veronica was teasing me because everywhere we went, they wanted to know where we were from. And Veronica's from Atlanta and Rachel is from Fort Collins and I grew up in Colorado. But regardless, I would say Wyoming and they were just like, look at me. But one guy, (laughs) this one young guy, I was so grateful for him because he came up to me. And he said, do you speak English? And I said, yes. And, and he said, can I, can I talk to you in English? And I said, yeah, I love that. So he was practicing his English and he was Brazilian and had never been to the United States, but spoke really good English, actually. And so we were just talking. He said, where are you from? And I said, Wyoming. He goes, oh, do you know? Oh, gosh, his, his name just went out of my head. I don't even <laughs> the rapper. Um, oh, Kanye West. Kanye West. He goes, do you know Kanye West? <laughs> And I said, no, not personally. He goes, do you live near him? And I go, well, kind of, if you know what I mean, I kind of do, but no. So anyway, it was just hilarious. And then I told my daughter, don't ever say I can't say I'm from Wyoming. (laughs) (laughs) I said, we're on the map now. Put on the map. Yeah. Well, uh, honestly, though, if I would say uh, Yellowstone National Park, people would know about that. So that was always a good point of reference. Yeah, that's true. So when you t- talk about Invisible Wyoming in your film and the the reasons you made that film, why were you the person to tell the story? Hmm, that's a good question. I felt like you need, first of all, I think to tell a story like that, it helps to have an insider and an outsider perspective. When we grow up in our own story, it's hard to tell it because we don't know why it might be interesting to other people. You know what I mean? So um, I think that that was part of it. Part of it was things needed to grow and evolve enough to that I would be able to tell the story. So I guess, for example, so if I'm in Denver and I'm explaining to somebody that, you know, we had to go by a first name basis only when we met people um, who were also part of the gay or queer community, they would because because to protect like we don't want to use last names because someone might lose their job or get outed to their family people would think, wow, that's really, we didn't do that where I was, you know? So, 
so I would start to realize, oh, okay, not everyone had this the same experience. So is is Wyoming so isolated in that way that it doesn't have that open, diverse gay community? I don't know about the open part. And again, that's changed a lot because part of what I was doing was sort of reflecting back on the history and, and some of the untold history. of, of And the, the reason the history is untold was because people couldn't share it because they didn't feel safe. I would say one thing I actually loved with it was the diversity. And that's pretty much true across the board. If you're part of this community, you can go around the world and you can find your community wherever you're at. And that's really cool. In Wyoming as well, like there was diversity within the community and not just ethnic or race diversity, but there was also age diversity, men and women. And I really love that because I thought it was like that everywhere. That was something that I remember the first time I went to San Francisco, I thought this is going to be great. It's going to be like, everyone's my best friend. We're going to be high-fiving. And it wasn't like that at all because that's how it was in Wyoming. It's like, oh, if you're part of First of all, everyone's real friendly in Wyoming to begin with. And and if you were part of the the queer community, then everyone just kind of, you know, looked looked to you like a brother or sister, I guess. That's how I thought of it. I got a surprise when I went to San Francisco and there were so many people, they were able to fraction off into cliques. You know what I mean? So they might be more divided, actually, uh, by by gender or race or, you know, age. And I hadn't anticipated that. That's the beauty, I think, of growing up in a state where there is such a small population. When people know you and love you, even if they found out you were gay or had an opinion about that, I don't think that would stop them from loving you. It hasn't that hasn't been the case for me. I mean, I'm sure it has been the case for other people. The other thing is, honestly, like people kind of just start <clears throat> one of my friends in the film said, oh, well, in my family, it's always been an open secret. <laughs> Meaning sometimes in the West, in the interior West in general, we just don't talk about personal stuff that much. We just accept each other at face value for who we are. I mean, I don't even care. I, you know, I didn't used to care anyways. I didn't care what what your politics were, or any of that stuff. I just, how you treated me and, and who you were as my neighbor or friend or relative, that's what was important to me. And so that's kind of what I always counted on. But however, if you're showing up to the family reunion for five years in a row with the same person, people start to click. Like you don't necessarily have to say, this is my partner. They just start to understand that's the case. That's a kind of way of that. It be, that's the kind of open secret way. The other way is just to say, hey, well, nowadays I can say, hey, this is my wife, you know, just the same way somebody else would. So that is so, so true. I love that term, open secret. <laughs> you know it's true, but there's no reason to have a discussion about it. And I think that is a, a really good way to be because it's no one's business. It's your personal choices, and it doesn't make you better, worse, different. You know, I just think that that should be the attitude that, okay, that's Patricia's choice. That's her life. <laughs> And honestly, it's only one part of my identity. I think why why I loved making Invisible Wyoming so much is that the two strongest parts of my identity are being from Wyoming and being part of the LGBTQ community. Most people that I've met outside of Wyoming have met somebody who they might identify as being gay, but less of them have met someone from Wyoming. <laughs> So, oh my gosh, that's so funny. <laughs> so I usually had more explaining to do on the Wyoming end, except when I'm in Wyoming, then it turned then the tables are turned the other direction. They're more likely not to have met maybe or openly have met somebody that identifies that way. So now this is kind of a switch, but when did the word queer become cool? That's a good question. You know, back in the 90s, I was working for the Casper Star Tribune. One of the other reporters, his name's Jason Marsden, he later became in charge of the Matthew Shepard Foundation. But Jason and I, our bosses knew that that we both identified as gay, but we hadn't actually come out to each other. Well, they sent us to cover a gay rodeo in Montana, which which was a lot of fun. Back, this is the 90s, and there were people wearing t-shirts that said queers and steers. And so um, and I think we published a photo that said that. And I remember um, I saw my parents after the article was published and my dad's like, how'd you like hanging out with the queers? 
And I was like, Dad, you know, you're not supposed to say that. And he said, why not? They put it on a T-shirt. So, so for me, that's the first time I remember hearing that word. And kind of, it's one of those words that, you know, was used as an insult, but then is reclaimed by a community. And I like it because I feel like it covers the gamut. Because, you know, as we know now, there's lots of different ways of identifying. So that's why I like that word. That's so interesting to me because I guess I feel like the reason I never liked the word is because, well, first of all, it was like a bad word, right? Yeah. You didn't use that word. And it also kind of had this meaning of being weird. Yeah, that's true. And I don't like thinking about that when I think about the gay community, because I think that that's where they don't want to be. Well, maybe. I like to embrace my weirdness. <laughs> okay. See, okay. Thing. Well, that's a good thing to know, that you embrace <laughs> the weirdness. Okay. Well, that's good. <laughs> I guess I, I just, didn't look at it like that. Gr- growing up, in, I didn't I didn't actually identify that way until I moved out of the state. And that's it's not an uncommon experience that you need to move away from your hometown, even if you stay in the same state or whatever, to help form your identity. It's really hard to not have people around you forming your identity unless you have a chance to kind of get outside of, you know, that bubble of where you grew up. So um, so I guess for me, when I growing up in Casper, you know, I was just one of those kids who I played the cello. I took photos for the yearbook, you know, but I was also in 4-H. And so I had friends that were in all different places and, and, you know, I dressed weird, but that's okay. You know, they, they all had known me since I was a kid. So it might've been different had I come from out of town (laughs) dressed weird. (laughs) Interesting. Yes. Yes. That's so true. They just embraced who you were because they knew you. And that's also just one of those things about Whoever you are, wherever you are, I love when people can embrace other people for who they are and not judge and not, you know, have to have an opinion about everything and or everyone. One of the things I wanted to ask you is about your films in general. Do you always try and tell a story that's really different that is about not necessarily the LBGTQ community, but about people who are marginalized? Let me put it that way. I have been doing that. And so in a couple of my other documentaries, one is the Clara Angel of the Rockies, who was an ex-slave who came to Colorado in 1859. And another one is Nicodemus, Kansas, which is an all black town in Kansas. I think for me, and, and again, really as a storyteller, is you start to get kind of an intuition about what a good story is. And I also try to see, you know, has the story already been told? Has it already been told in certain ways before? You know, is it worth me to 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 tell that story? You know, because I think those are stories that I think need to be shared. And also that I really enjoyed learning while I was working on all of them. Well, I did notice that when I was just doing some research and looking for your films online. And I did notice that they were about marginalized communities. And because you, even in your Invisible Wyoming, you you do have a focus on the Matthew Shepard incident and and who he was as a person. And just hearing his parents talk was really heartfelt. And I didn't get to watch uh, Nicodemus, is that what it's called? Mm -hmm. I didn't get to watch that one, but I'm going to because I just started the very beginning of it. And then I want to go back to it because it looks super interesting. But the third one you talked about, where where can we find that one? Oh, Clara? Yeah. Um, well, it's on my, if, if you just put my name in Google search, Patricia McEnroe, you'll find my website. And I have a link to it on my website, but it was, so that particular one actually aired on PBS And it did that because I entered a competition um, that was sponsored by a show called To the Contrary with Bonnie Bay, And they were they were featuring all women filmmakers and mine won the Women's History Award or whatever. So anyway, so it aired nationally on PBS. And because of that, they still have it on the PBS site. I want you to tell the audience, one, where they can find you so that they can um, watch your films. Right. You have to click a couple times because I put it. So if you go to like patriciamcenroy.com, which luckily my name is unusual. So that's lucky for me. And then if you go to to videos at the top and then there's a documentary section. 
So under the documentaries and I have other, you know, I have experimental films and I have a little series of my mom called low tech talk. That's just intended to be humorous. They're like a little one minute, <laughs> little one minute kind of funny videos. I like to use humor a lot as well. So. Oh my gosh, that is so great. I'll have to, I'll have to look for those because for Mother's Day this year, my daughter actually made a video of me making fun of me and what it's <laughs> like growing up. <laughs> What's it like growing up with Emlyn, you know? So anyway, it was just hilarious. This is, yeah. So my mom and my mom's, you know, my mom's a Wyoming native and she passed away last year. You know, when she was about 85, I was noticing too that, you know, she always needed help with technical stuff. Of course, you know, I need help with technical stuff, but she knew all this other stuff. Like she still had a manual typewriter and she still had a landline phone and she still used the phone book, you know? So I made each segment is her explaining one of those things, you know, and she has that really cool, like folksy uh, wisdom way of talking, you know? So she's explaining. And I said, you know, explain it to the younger generation that, that, didn't grow up with all this. So, so that's what, that's what it is. It's called low tech talk. Um, And it's something I just, I made it for fun, but it was also a fun way for me and my mom to connect. I love that. That is so cool. It has been so great talking to you, Patricia, and so fun. And tell us once again, ways that we can connect with you on Facebook, I don't know, Instagram and your website. What are, what are those? The best way is through my website. So patriciamcenroy.com. And on there too, you'll find, if you go to the contact, it's got my email. Invisible Wyoming, the full version is not available online right now because I'm trying to get it, you know, it's been in, it's been in like six film festivals. I'm trying to get it on a streaming service, but anyone who emails me directly, I'll send them a link to the full film. But you can see that my, all you can see my other ones are all available. Usually what I do is I let them run the film festival gamut and then and then I go ahead and put them online. So all the other ones you can see there, you know, I'm on Facebook and Instagram, but my presence isn't it, it's better just to go through my website. So. OK. OK, great. Well, it's been great talking to you today. Thank you so much. Well, thanks. It's been a real honor to, to be included. Thank you for joining us for this episode of What's Your Why? Brought to you by Wyoming Humanities with support from Wyoming Community Foundation and generous supporters like you. To learn more, go to thinkwhy.org, subscribe, and never miss a show. 